So now we're going to get into how memories are stored. What are some of the processes and where are memories stored as well? So first, as I mentioned in the last video lecture, there are three main parts of memory that you need to know about, encoding, consolidation, and retrieval. So encoding is when sensory information is encoded into short-term memory. So when it goes from that very short-term sensory information, you pay attention to it, and it gets transferred or encoded into short-term memory, that's this encoding step here. Consolidation is when that information then gets consolidated into long-term storage. So it moves from short-term memory into long-term memory. And lastly, retrieval is when the stored information is retrieved. And why these are important is errors or problems at any one of these three areas can lead to memory problems. So obviously if you don't encode, then the rest of the system doesn't work. Or if you have trouble with retrieval, then the rest of the system doesn't work. So with that, uh, when there are memory deficits, we typically have to look to try to figure out where is the problem in order to figure out what suggestions to provide the person with how to um, compensate for that memory deficit. So again, what we see here, the hypothesized um, memory pathway, I guess you would say, is we have these sensory buffers. So these are those little buffers of, you know, either tenths of a second for vision or you know, one and a half seconds for auditory, you know, it just depends on the sense, where you have, you have those held, and then if you pay attention to those, they get encoded and put into short-term memory, where they can either be worked through and then put into uh, long-term memory, so that would be this consolidation, or they can be used immediately. And then both from long-term memory and from the short-term memory, you can have loss of information. And this can be either due to problems with encoding, consolidation, or with um, pulling that information back. So what we know from fMRI studies is it seems that there are multiple brain regions that are involved with encoding. So again, this is shifting from that um, sensory memory into short-term memory. So for recalling pictures, you see um, especially, active, especially um, high activation in the right prefrontal cortex and the parahippocampal cortex in both hemispheres. Now, words are a little different, as you guess, you know, with um, the um, hemispheric specialization, language is typically on the left, and what you see here is consistent with that, that for words, it's actually the left prefrontal cortex and left parahippocampal cortex that are activated um, for recalling words. Consolidation of memory, so again, this is going from short-term to long-term memory, involves the hippocampus, but memories are not stored in the hippocampus. So that's why HM, you know, when he had his hippocampus removed, he was able to remember the things that happened before that time, but not the things that happened after. So the hippocampus is important for consolidating memories. It is not where the memories are stored. Rather, the memories are stored in the cortex near where the memory was first processed. So what you see here is where different uh, memories are stored in the brain. So auditory, you know, more around here, whereas visual, of course, back more in the visual cortex. So... Episodic and semantic memories, we talked about them being different, and they are processed in slightly different areas. Um, episodic memories cause greater activation than um, semantic in the right frontal and temporal lobes. So you don't have to know a lot about this. There's only one quiz question on it, and you just need to know that there's a lot of overlap in where... Um, and where declarative memories are stored in general. But the main difference, again, is episodic memories have greater activation in the right frontal and the temporal lobes. So know that, you'll be fine. Early research has um, indicated that animals form this cognitive map um, 
and we do this too, we form a cognitive map that's a mental representation of spatial relationships. So I can't speak for everyone, I just know for myself, you know, if I'm in a new situation, I will, I'll truly, you know, picture a map and picture where I've been and landmarks along the way, and I use that to help me find my way. So animals do the same type of thing. Now with this, you can also have latent learning, which is um, learning that has taken place but has not yet been demonstrated in performance tests. So let me give you an example of this. So let's say, um, let's say halfway going to work, there's a new Starbucks that opens. Um, I haven't been there before. I I've never tested whether or not I can go. You know, I can go there, but I know where it is because you know I pass it going to work. So there's latent learning that's happened. I know I know where it is and I know how to get there, um, even though it. I've never been tested on it. No one's ever said, okay, prove to me you know how to go there. And it's also not something I've been trying to learn. It's just something I happen to learn along the way. So one thing that's interesting with memory is we do see differences in brain size depending on the, um, the use of the memory. So comparisons of behaviors and brain size show that the more demands you have for spatial memory, the more hippocampal size um, we, you have for mammals and birds. So in species that actually have to store their food places, the hippocampus is larger, but only if they have, if they're a species that has to go and refine that stored food. So again, it's like what we've learned with brain plasticity um, earlier on. The more you use brain, certain brain areas, usually the larger th they will not become, but the larger that area de dedicated to that activity will be. So we see that same, um, same thing here with the animals. Also, imaging studies um, that have been conducted um, in order to try to gain a better understanding of what brain areas are active um, in several different types of memory. This is also helpful for determining whether these memory types are related or truly distinct. And one cool thing from this, um, these imaging studies that's been found is that with priming, it seems to be that priming actually leads to a decrease in activation. So why might this be? Well, the thought is that priming may actually make the task easier. So when you prime something, there's less brain activation because the brain doesn't have to work as hard. It already has an idea of what the answer may be due to the priming. So I thought that was kind of an interesting um, finding. So another way that we've um, investigate what different brain regions do as far as memory is looking at brain re brain lesions in rats. So in this eight arm radial maze, this maze, um, this has been used to test spatial location memory. So for this, rats must act in, must recognize an intern arm that they've entered into recently in order to receive a reward. And what they found is that only lesions to the hippocampus produced a deficit in this um, predominantly spatial task. So here you see different, um, so they didn't do as nearly as well if the hippocampus was lesioned, but controls and those with caudate nucleus or um, extra striate visual cortex lesions did roughly about the same. So we, it looks like for, um, again, spatial tasks um, hippocampus seems to be very important for consolidating those memories. In a memory test of motor behavior, the animal must remember whether it made a, a right or a left turn previously. If it turns the same way as it did before, it will receive a reward. Here, only animals with the caudate nucleus lesion show deficits. The others did not. Sensory perception can be measured by the object recognition test, where the rat must identify which stimulus in a pair of novel stimuli um, is novel, so which one is new. 
And this test seems to depend on the edge to striate um, visual cortex, as you can see, whereas the other three are all very similar. So here's a brief interim summary of the brain regions that are involved in learning and memory. The main thing to take from this is that different types of memory do seem to rely on different brain areas, and that's part of what seems to make them distinct. Um, so take a peek at this, um, at this figure. I think if you're able to learn this, it'll help you quite a bit on the quiz.